Thank you, Fiona. Okay, well, welcome to the debate section now, which is on the future of medical publishing. Now, the rules of engagement here are that each panelist will get four minutes to give us their view of the future of medical publishing, and then we are going to get some questions that have already, in question time style, been uh, texted in, and we have selected those uh, for their ability to create some debate and division in the panel. Uh, and to provide some uh, uh, exciting debate for us to take forward. So uh, we'll take some questions if there's time at the end in response to that. Uh, but first of all, if we could have all the panelists up here. First, I'd like to invite Carl Hennigan to uh, give his four minutes view on the future medical publishing. Carl, as we know, is director for the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine. Carl, thanks. thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. When asked to comment on the future of anything, uh, you should be minded of the many who've made fools of themselves, memory on the banana peel of prediction. So, Sir Alan Sugar, Amstrad chief, you'll know in the UK, has a reputation for straight chalking. What then was he aiming for when he said in an interview in February 2005, Next Christmas, the iPod will be dead, finished, gone, kaput. So, to talk about the future, I wanted to go back 20 years, actually, to a, a book published 20 years ago, The Future of Medical Journals in Commemoration of 150 Years of the British Medical Journey, edited by Stephen Locke. And this is what David Sharp, editor of The Lancet at the time, wrote in a review published in JAMA. I'm very grateful that I was sent this book to review. It is the kind of book of general interest reading that now remains at the bottom of my reading heap. Here are some of the comments. Any discussion of the future of medical publication has to take into account the possibility of a paper-free world. In that world, depressing or bright, depending on where you look at it from, the bound journal gradually disappears. The participant editors of the journals at that time had to change their habits. Editors were now looking for ways of presenting data in a clinician-friendly format, yet those same editors are under pressure from people like Dr. Ian Chalmers and Brian Haynes, both contributors to this symposium, who may not in contribute to the friendliness. I don't think there's much different actually today about what you guys go, but why I'm here to talk is I think about two things. I wanted to talk about your own participation, and also the second thing was about conflict. Uh, about two years ago, a friend of mine, uh, Amy Banerjee, who's in the audience here today, we sat in a pub in Oxford and got very frustrated about the amount of articles we read and how angry we got about the articles, and decided to start our own blog called Trust the Evidence, and that's led to a whole new understanding of the publishing world. And it's interesting, I was talking to Ben Goldacre before this. I'm a great admirer of what he does. Seven years he's been doing his blog, and he was talking to me about how at one session he'd said about his own forum, he was going to close it down unless 12 people actually started a blog in the next 24 hours. And some of them have been very influential. And so your ability to participate of individuals is very important for the narrative. To create opinion that's relevant and up-to-date relies on more trusted sources. And our journals are too slow for them sources. So one of my causes to you is to think about how you may participate. And I know today that actually on Twitter, a lot of people who are active here, and I know Annabelle Bentley runs one, 7,000 followers on Twitter, a lot of people now know I don't know. Finally, I think conflict of interest is a barrier to moving forward, and we could talk about all sorts, but I, I applaud the BMJ and Lancet because in a, in a review of, of publications about income, income from reprints, but actually the Lancet told us that they get 41% of their income from reprints. Many of the journals are not transparent enough to actually give us the data to say this is where our income, this is our conflict of interest. And so I think that's important. I think the bad news for publishers though is how are they going to come to terms with the unlimited expanse of the internet and it's no wonder Cornell University decided to review and prune its $1.7 million a year business to Elselvia because the future on the internet is unlimited, but actually it's going to be difficult to make money in a difficult world. Thank you.
Thanks, Carl. And next, Dr. Fiona Godley, editor in chief of the BMJ. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm, I would say that medical publishing is thriving, and um, in difficult economic times, those of us in the publishing industry, in medicine in particular, are relatively protected from um, economic uh, decline because this is must have information. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that that is a very privileged position to be in. I think there's a lot of good things happening in medical publishing, a lot of innovative thinking, a lot of uh, opportunities being grasped, um, a lot of creativity. Um, but I also think there's a lot that is not good. And I was heard to say in a session earlier that I think um, that there is very much that is indeed very badly broken in medical publishing, um, and in particular in um, academic research publication. I think we have so much evidence now that the uh, academic published literature is full of holes. The holes are uh, invisible, so we can't tell where they are. We can't tell the extent of them. Um, we have inadequate resource to identify them. We have inaccurate reporting. We have incomplete reporting. We have the vast majority of data on drugs and devices in the hands of the manufacturers of drugs and devices. Um, and we have um, small armies of systematic reviewers and investigative journalists uh, picking away at this uh, rather um, holy, in the wrong sense of the word, edifice um, that needs a great deal more scrutiny. So I think we have a real problem. And um, if we're talking about evidence-based medicine, I personally used to take the evidence very much for granted. The big issue was encouraging clinicians and patients to use it. I think our job now is to uh, make clear to clinicians and patients that the evidence itself is not to be um, entirely trusted. It needs to be scrutinized, and they need to employ a great deal of skepticism when applying it in practice. I think we have commercial conflicts of interest. Um, industry is obviously a major source of that. Publishing itself is rife, rife with its own commercial interests. We've got reprint revenue. Um, we've got vested interests, journals publishing work, which they themselves feel they have to uh, um, uh, justify they published and maybe find it hard to accept criticism of. So journal editors, uh, we ourselves, have uh, hidden vested interests that are hard to acknowledge. Academia has vested interests, doctors themselves, uh, uh, right the way through. All of these things are perhaps inevitable, but we absolutely need to be um, clear about them. Um, I think a journal like the BMJ and the Lancet and other journals that um, uh, are directed to doctors, although the audience is doctors, the, the, the aim of the journal, speaking certainly for the BMJ, is that the best interest of patients should be served. And those two interests are not always in line. And I think that, again, can be an interesting source of conflict. Um, I hope to see greater transparency right across the medical publishing world, greater access. Open access is certainly a challenge to medical publishers. Some are seeing it as an opportunity. Uh, the BMJ group does have open access. Um, BMJ itself is open access for the research. And we've just launched a, a new journal called BMJ Open, which is an author pays uh, open access journal. It's not without problems. Uh, and it's still a, a model which has to prove itself. But I think I'm, I'm very glad to be in a publishing house which is taking up that opportunity and, and seeing it as such rather than as entirely a threat. Um, I hope that open access, to my mind, doesn't mean lower quality. I, I, I think people often think that it does mean that. I think readers will want greater, they will still want quality. Um, and as research increasingly goes online, as data is published online, they'll want high quality commentary that they will perhaps be willing to pay for. And that, maybe the publishing model of the future, that research goes up online um, for open scrutiny. Uh, increasingly, we want all research up online, data as well, and that the uh, journal's role uh, and other publishing role may be just to provide really high quality um, commentary on that research. Journals and publishers also have an opportunity to serve as advocates um, for uh, better healthcare, better research, um, and a whole host of hopefully improvements that will bring a a better life. I think that um, overall one of the roles I see for medical journals is to enhance the scrutiny of vested interest and to represent patients' views um, to improve the evidence base for treatments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. Now if I could call on Bill Summerskill, Executive Editor of The Lancet. Bill.
Well, Carl, I'm going to meet your 20 years and raise you 20. Going back to 1970, when I had the great opportunity to first start working in a printing press. And it was a noisy, smelly, hot, dangerous, and awfully exciting place to be. The copy came not from a computer disk, but through a compressed air linotype onto spools of paper, which we then took into the casting room, which had molten lead, lots of exciting fumes, and line by line the letters were cast, and then placed into great behemoths of machines with large Victorian flywheels. Now, looking back at that, the mechanism of production is now unrecognizable. All of that is gone. Each week when we upload the Lancet to the printer, it's on the website with a touch of the return key. But actually the process hasn't changed a bit. It still relies on judicious editorial oversight. It still relies on aesthetic makeup, on painstaking proofreading. So I think the process, as we look to the future, is going to continue. The mechanism will change dramatically. And there's one other factor, and that's quality. And in the last 40 years, we have seen a great improvement in quality for medical publication with the adoption of peer review. So as we look forward to the future, I would say the process will remain anchored in the sort of attitude that pays attention to detail and recognizes that you're only as good as your last edition. The quality will continue to improve out of demand for better evidence and for better application. And the mechanism will change. Well, how will that mechanism change? I see three big drivers on the horizon. One of them is obviously technology, which is going to fuel expectations, but also provide solutions. The journal article, as you know it, is going to become a much richer entity with far more web-related material to it. I think we'll also see layered articles, so that if all you want is an abstract, you'll get that, but you can also drill down through a BMJ Pico type version, through a Lancet full text version, to something like a Cochrane systematic review, depending on your interests and requirements. I also believe that technology is going to mean that research becomes available to people everywhere in their local language. But at the same time, globalization is going to drive external validity for research. And we're going to see much more transparency. So much so that I expect even observational studies will be registered ahead of time with pre-specified protocols. The other two factors are Asia and economics. They're related. You will not see a panel about publishing in the future, which has got three white editors. Asia is the driving force for research. Chinese is becoming a dominant language on the internet. China is publishing vast numbers of high impact uh, uh, factor journal articles. So we are going to see Chinese medical articles leading the field and prominent Chinese language medical uh, publications that I imagine by the end of your professional lifetimes you will be proud to publish in. And economics, of course. We live in a post-banking crisis world. This not only will have an influence on the money available to support a high investment process like publishing. Yes, it will mean editors do, will need to do more with less, but it means there'll be different ways of looking at funding and financing. It also means that the public will have greater demands on how public money is spent. I think we'll see a changed distribution model. 
in that work that is financed through the MRC, the Wellcome Trust, at present is made available free of charge to users. I think we will see expansions of that model. I also think the public will change how it rates journals. It will no longer lo look at crude metrics like impact factor and so on. Instead, it's going to want social value and there will be a new measure which will look what sort of value do journals return to society in terms of health outcomes. So we're looking at a world when journals are going to have less power. For instance, embargoes on journal articles I think will disappear. And we're looking at a future where journal editors are going to be sitting in the audience listening to researchers about the agenda. But it's always difficult looking at the future. Nothing is more tarnished than yesterday's visions of tomorrow. So I would side with Alan Kay, the computer scientist, who says the best way to predict the future is actually to invent it. And I look forward to an exciting debate in the next 20 minutes when we actually reinvent the future for medical publishing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill. And now for our first, first, uh, final presentation, David Tovey, Editor-in-Chief of the Cochrane Library. <clears throat> so when I was asked to do this, I looked at the, uh, the question, I looked at the people, and I thought, blimey, we might all agree. And then I saw that I was talking after Tom Jefferson, and I thought, well, I better be a bit Dr. Upbeat then. Otherwise, we will all agree. And then I realized he wasn't coming. He wasn't coming to debate. So now I'm going to sound a bit like Dr. Blind Naivety. Uh, but anyway, that's how we go. Um, I think despite the fact that everything we've heard today, despite Doug and Ian and Fiona, um, and I like her line, the research evidence is full of holes, I think there are grounds for cautious optimism. So we all agree that publishing and health is changing, and it's going to continue to change, and I think that that's a really good thing. And I look back to my time when I was a GP almost 15 years ago, uh, when we'd, within our partnership we would have to buy our individual copies of the Lancet and Annals and, and BMJ, and of course we didn't actually, but uh, we should have done. Um, and I think those days are now gone. So as we move towards uh, information, as we move toward the future, I think we're looking at information that's genuinely shaped around the needs of its users. So I think we need to start talking less about journals and, and think more about content, and think more about cu content customised around the needs of the user. And I think uh, changes will come in three forms. First, the actual content itself. Secondly, the way it's presented. And thirdly, the way it's delivered. So in content terms. Um, I think I'm, too, I'm taking Mike Clark's line, but you know, trials will begin and end with a systematic review. We see more evidence synthesis. I look back to my days as a GP again, and I remember the way that we wobbled between antihypertensives, this week beta blockers, next week thiazide diuretics, and next week ACE inhibitors, just following the trial by trial. I think it will increasingly become the more norm to look at systematic reviews. I think also we're seeing a revolution starting with cl clinical trial registries, moving through uh, results registers, uh, data repositories, licensing databases. I think it's inconceivable that within one decade or two, although Ian slightly worried me about on that score, we won't have full access to full trial data, including protocols and, uh, and all the data. So what journals will have to do is to add value and find new readers. And I think we'll see increased translations for the public, democratizing knowledge further. We'll see more education and multimedia content. We'll see lots of non-English content. We'll start to see people dividing added value with reports and reviews. So attached to a systematic review, there might be an economic analysis or evaluation of the non-randomized evidence or qualitative studies. And I think if we think in global health terms, uh, Bill is completely right about China, have been there recently, and they're going to produce an army of fantastic researchers who will work a lot harder than I ever will. There'll be more research and reviews conducted in low, middle income country settings by people from those settings reflecting the actual burden of disease. 
In presentation terms, content will be more accessible. I do th think the rise of open access is probably inex inexorable, although it does, as Fiona says, create problems. We'll see lots of summarized and customized content, but most importantly, we'll see increased in interactivity. People will be able to question the trialists. We'll be able to exploit digital uh, alternat alternatives, so you won't have to read the beginning to the end of a trial necessarily. You'll be able to bounce between the bits that most interest you. And in delivery, the last, I think we will see an end of paper journals. Um, we'll have multiple platforms, PDAs, smartphones. And it may sound troubling, but I get a, I get a tube to work, a London tube to work every day, and I have to put up with the metro. It's so much greater if the BMJ popped into my um, uh, so far uh, non-existent uh, iPad. Still, there's always hope. We'll see innovative forms of evidence. I recently b visited a chap called David McCandless, who makes the evidence for a lots of alternative therapists that's so beautiful you might want to put it on your wall. And we'll also, of course, see evidence in decision support applications, really in their infancy at the moment, guiding doctors and patients towards sensible decisions. So in conclusion, I think there are reasons for cautious optimism, notwithstanding all the concerns that people have raised. I think we do have to think about content for people, not journals, and customization and interactivity are the key. And what about the BMJ? There's no question it's prospering, it will prosper, but perhaps not via my letterbox. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. And so to business. Now, Tom Jefferson couldn't be on this panel, he had to fly back, and he's renowned for his fire, but he's left us a smoking gun in the form of this question. What can journals do to make sure studies that are done by pharma have results made publicly available and that they are accurately reported? I don't know who wants to take the lead on this. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been working with Tom actually for the last six months. It's been an energizing time, thoughtful <laughs> and provoking at the same time. And we had a meeting about a month ago in Oxford where Tom Jefferson, Matthew Thompson is in the room, Chris Delmar came to Oxford and had a phone conversation with, and we're working hard to understand unpublished data, which is not easy. I've spent the last two weeks looking at a clinical study report, one study, it's 6,000 pages long, and it's not easy. But I think what the journals need to do, and, and Ian said this about the Lancet, like if you do a trial, is it a systematic review? I think they should start to ask particular companies, what is this study in terms of your trial program? How many trials exist? And how many have been published and how many are currently not published? And that way it would be like me as an individual giving my conflict of interest, it would be the pharmaceutical just saying, here's what we do and this is trial five, of 12, and you'll know only three have been published, and we all know when they do that, they will start to see some of the holes. Thanks, Carl. Who else wants to do um, Yes, I mean, I, I share many of Tom's concerns, as, as was written about in the journal. Um, I mean, I think, I, think, I think things are improving. Lots of good things have happened. Trial registration is a, is a, a, a big improvement understanding about the need to look at the raw data rather than rely on what is submitted to a journal, which, I mean, frankly, you know, that's based on a trust um, arrangement, which very often in these circumstances doesn't seem to hold. So I think we have to recognize that the traditional peer review process is not up to the job that it's currently being asked to do. Um, and so further legislation to push for trial registration across the board and to increasingly require data, raw data and summary data to be published and made available is absolutely key and journals can continue to, can really push for that. I think journals are going to begin to group together. I'm hoping that the ICMJE, which is the international grouping of, of major journals, um, by some, yes, a certain group of major journals, um, should now, moving on from trial registration, push for a requirement that data be made available as part of the peer review process so that journals can at least um, look for that if, if, if need be. Um, I absolutely agree that, that um, the systematic review of trial pro programs rather than individual trials or individual groups of trials, which Tom is beginning to, is advocating, is crucial. Um, we need to make sure that the investigators um, can hand on heart say they have seen the raw data, which I'm afraid too often does not seem to be the case. Um, so there's a whole host of changes which, over, which, which together I think will improve things. 
Um, and I think we will see an improvement in things going forward. We've then got the enormous problem of the legacy of the existing evidence base, which I'm afraid is down to the Cochrane collaboration and um, whoever else has got the patience to, to dig around into it um, for us to actually understand what, what's going on there. Uh, and I think the worry is that if we don't actually get to the bottom of that, new drugs coming onto the market will seem uh, will, will, will compete in an unequal way with those drugs that were re reviewed um, in an earlier age. So we've got a real mismatch about new and old uh, evidence here. It was in 2005 that The Lancet published the paper on paroxetine showing harmful effects of unpublished uh, data on that drug in adolescents. And I think that sent a shiver through anyone who read that paper, wondering just how much other data was squirreled away. And the problem with trial registration is it only goes partially towards addressing that problem. Because just because a trial is registered doesn't ensure that the results are going to come to light in an objective manner. So it is a problem that journals have not solved yet. I think Ian Chalmers has been particularly valuable in alternatively, as Muir would have said this morning, stimulating and irritating. Uh, certainly in helping a more explicit context in which findings are placed in light of existing evidence. But I wonder if the next step is to go beyond that. And just as one would expect to see a good systematic review explain that unpublished data had been looked for and how it had been looked for, we may be seeing that as a routine part of general uh, studies when they're published, the efforts to uncover previous studies that might have been done and not reported. Uh, I think it's an exciting area it's one we need to, to work on, and when it does happen, I think it's going to be quite scary. I, mean, I, I would agree, uh, having been an even bitter of a bit player on the neuroamidase inhibitor story, how scarring and, in a way, frightening that whole experience has been thinking you have so many trials, then suddenly finding you have so many more trials, then suddenly you have so many more multiples of trials. So, you know, one can't be naive about this. This is a, there are lots of real problems. Um, I agree with Fee that, um, as the I think the medical editors of the question, medical editors need to work together with the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors to push for the widest possible availability and access to data, uh, going beyond trials registration to results databases uh, and data repositories. Um, and I, we, should, we should also work to, with others, I think, looking for legislation to push some of these things through. I suspect they're mainly inevitable, but the speed with which they happen can really be determined by how, much, how, how hard and fast people push. Can I, can I just... <coughs> there seems to me two things that have really worried me. One is the idea that a, a clinician, sorry for the non-clinician, but the clinician, you sort of take an oath about conflict of interest and being ethical and that people can write papers and never see the paper. That seems to me as to be a GMC reportable offence and it's unethical. And if that happens, we should make it clear that's what's going to happen. The second is this ICJMA sort of, you register your trial seems to be wonderfully great for pharma actually because they register the trial and they meet the requirements and say thank you very much. There's actually no requirement from an ethical point of view or from the publishers to then say, you have to publish this in a certain amount of time. And so we are seeing trials appear, like Tom will have said, cardiotoxicity trials trying to say it's now safe, 12 years after it's first initiated, released it as a marketing trial program. So then two things, and I particularly, I can't, I think trial registry is actually helping them in some ways. Well, just, just on that, there is the um, FDA Amendment Act, which um, again, only comes prospectively, so it doesn't help mm -hmm. retrospectively, but which, which is requiring now all trials of a certain type to um, publish their summary findings within a year of the last patient being randomised. So I think we're getting there, and European legislation is on its way. So, I mean, I, I'm sounding more optimistic than I am, but I do think we, we, have, we have a 
There's a beginning there. Sounds like a research program for Doug. <laughs> Uh, but also, um, people looking at systematic reviews now can find some, we know, some unpublished data through the trials registers. I mean, we can't, we can't, uh, under, uh, we can't underestimate that that's quite how important that should, that should be. I, I think the, the interesting thing, I don't know if some of you in the room, I don't know how many of you have done systematic reviews in the room or participated in a review? Quite a lot, about half. I, I, what I found really difficult, and I had this chat with Mike Clark, if we go down this unpublished data route, if we had a study of about 10 trials, we reckon it will take a minimum two years of time. And I've only ever had £7,000 for my systematic review research so far. So one of the problems is taking systematic reviews seriously from a funding prospect. And we currently don't do that. And if we don't do that, we will never solve the problem as well. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, this text was truncated, so I apologize, I can't say who it's from if they're in the audience and they recognize it, they might put up their hand. In the US, patients and the public are suspicious when told about evidence. They don't trust the source because they fear treatment will be withheld. I'd like to know from the panel, do they think this is true and what can we do about it? Who patients to... and the public are suspicious. They're suspicious when told about evidence, they don't trust the source because they fear treatment will be withheld. I don't know who wants to kick off with this one. Go on, I'll have a go. I, I've <laughs> got an opinion on everything. <laughs> There's a piece in America that about 80% of the population check Google or the internet for healthcare information. So everybody checks healthcare information, more or less, and I'm sure you all do when you have a certain position. And I think the US is different in that the fact they have direct consumer to advertising issue. I think that's a different here, but I do think there is a key problem is trusted evidence and trusted science. The, the, the noise is considerable. And within there, we're going to have to continue to create individuals or organizations that you can trust. And without that, we will get into more and more trouble. And one of the things I didn't say is I think it's now harder to practice evidence-based medicine than it was 15 years ago. Because there's so much noise that actually it's hard to see what they call the signal or the true evidence in the background. Well, I would just I agree that trust is a real issue. And um, I think, as, as has been said, the US and the UK, or, or systems like the US system and systems like the UK system, are, are very different in terms of the sort of att attempt in a UK-like system to share a common good and in the US to see the individual's right to treatment as, as paramount and, and uh, as has been said the ability to market directly to patients I think increases their sense that they can, they can um, find the information and um, should be allowed to evaluate that in their own right. Now there's lots of good things about that and although I'm a, terrifically against um, direct consumer advertising for a whole host of I hope evidence based reasons um, there is the point about patients being empowered and exactly how you give patients information that is uh, unbiased and objective and trustworthy is a huge challenge for any country. Um, and again, it comes down to resources often, even in the UK, where traditionally we've resourced this kind of thing very well. Our budgets for patient information are um, under pressure and um, providing really good quality, up-to-date, evidence-based patient information is an extremely complicated and, and um, expensive job. So I mean I think we've, we've got a problem if, if patient information is largely being provided by industry which is the case in vast parts of the world especially if it's direct to consumer advertising um, and making clear to them what is trustworthy and what is not I think is, is very tough. And, and also uh, doctors bear vested interests, um, doctors who self-refer um, and, and are committed to um, diagnostic investigations if they've got a scanner or if they're a surgeon and they want to encourage surgery. There are all sorts of ways in which clinicians are also part of the whole supplier-induced demand that patients may find it hard to work out whether the information they've been given is, is trustworthy. So, a problem. Okay. I think it's fantastic to have so many people from the States here for this meeting. And it, it is a source of bewilderment that in a country with the greatest scientific and medical potential, evidence struggles so much. And when Obama 
approved $1.9 billion two years ago for reviews of effectiveness, the way it was reported in the press was as granny panels which would be deciding on euthanasia. And we don't have to look far at this time of midterm elections to realize that truths become an early casualty in this political climate. But I think it shows the importance of actually demonstrating the benefit of evidence elsewhere and making the case for transferability of evidence so overwhelming. I was told, and this was in sadness rather than humor, that the real problem of evidence in America was that Archie Cochrane wasn't American. And, you know, I think there is some truth to that. Uh, that perhaps evidence needs to find itself reinvented. But in a country where the, the healthcare expenditure is so high, the number as proportion of treated patients of adverse events and patient deaths is so high, it seems uh, totally illogical that evidence hasn't been embraced. And I think all of us who believe in evidence-based practice must share part of the blame for evidence not being established in North America, and we must all redouble our efforts to be part of the solution to see that it is. When we uh, saw the uh, public backlash to the Obama changes, I mean, I think they were genuinely shocking for people uh, else out of the United States um, because of the vehemence and acrimony that, that, that seemed to be there. But, you know, we don't know, and I think we don't know uh, whether, how much influence uh, insurers and other people had on sort of milking those particular si si situations. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm aware that you know, pe the, uh, the uh, people pre uh, the preventive trust force presenting the mammography and prostate guidelines have come in for an enormous amount of stick from people. Um, and I guess this all does come in the end down to trust. And one of the elements of trust is realism. And if you have direct consumer advertising, and if you have doctors complicit in uh, over-egging the benefits of treatments, then it's not really surprising that people have unrealistic expectations of uh, treatments, which make them skeptical and worrisome about some sort of rationing approach in terms of, co of cost. Um, but I, I don't think all is lost at all. I mean, the, it seems to me the comparative effectiveness research program is entirely promising and does seem to have made a, a big impact in the US. And I think particularly because its concentration is so much on application to clinical practice. Um, and I, I wouldn't give up hope on that. I think there's uh, some way to go on that program still. Okay. This next question is from Penelope Jarrett, who's a GP. And I think, David, I think we'll start with you on this one. How do we get policymakers to implement evidence based as opposed to Daily Mail based policies? I think there are two things here. One is that people have to make political decisions um, and sometimes that will mean that they, they take the evidence but they also look at other factors and I don't think we should be too shocked by that when it happens. People do have to keep an eye out for the popular view. Um, what one can hope is that policymakers make a, a view knowing the available evidence and taking the available evidence into, into consideration and being entirely transparent about the evidence where it exists. Um, but one can't expect that people won't, for whatever reason, have to occasionally make political uh, judgments. Uh, I think one expects them to be transparent about it but if you, uh, if you try and take politics out of policy making, then I think that's naive. I don't think that will happen. Well, I think it comes down to a basic fallacy that uh, we believe that people choose the politicians where in effect it's the other way around and the politicians choose their voters. Uh, the issue of evidence in policy uh, is particularly disturbing in light of the recent decision to fund homeopathy. Despite all the cutbacks, 
the repeated commons committees that have shown no scientific basis, homeopathy is being funded as a political expediency regardless of the opportunity cost and the harm that might ensue. So a number of high profile uh, respected scientists have written to the government and I think there's a really exciting change in the public media that when you get a letter written by a number of university leaders, by Nobel Prize winners, not only does it make it on the letters page, it gets picked up as a news item. So I think it's important that the battle over evidence continues to be fought, that people are held account uh, for decisions that are not based on evidence. Politically, uh, sorry, especially now when there just isn't the money in the health service coffers to actually be used on interventions that are not going to create the greatest value. And I believe that the current economic downturn offers evidence-based practice a do-or-die situation. Either it's the chance to really demonstrate the importance of interventions that give good economic and clinical benefits, or else it's a time when in blanket cutbacks, evidence-based medicine could come close to being snuffed out. So any opportunity, whether it's writing up a manuscript, whether it's in a presentation, to actually demonstrate the economic benefit of evidence is more important now than ever. Yes, I think um, probably a lot of it will require or does require those who understand the evidence to talk to policymakers and talk to the press um, and yes, talk to the Daily Mail and try to make sure that the me message will get across that is the right message. I mean, it's not always going to be the case and as, as Bill said, it's a constant slow process. One of the issues I think policymakers struggle with is that they often need answers now. And if they then go and commission a systematic review, it will take two years until they have the answer, by which time the questions they're asking will have changed. And I was talking to Paul Garner about this. He's at the Liverpool School of Hygiene, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, and he was saying how by wonderful chance, I'm afraid I can't remember the topic, but one of you may know, um, they were just completing a systematic review on some topic and it suddenly came up the policy agenda and wham, literally within a day or two of, of being asked, they were able to deliver this up-to-date top evidence and the people were amazed and were immediately able to act upon it. So I was saying to Paul, well, could Cochranites and other evidence generators be more alert to what the what's going on behind the scenes? Because you know, it does, these things don't suddenly pop up onto the policy agenda. Sometimes they do, but often they're kind of brewing. And so it may be that we've got to be more sophisticated in finding out what, what the issues are. So that we've, you know, the commissioning of, of systematic reviews is not researcher driven, rather like research itself, but that actually it is policy driven because that, that's how we can change things, is, is if the evidence is there when people need it. Sorry, I've lost my little sound effect. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always been minded that, uh, all that people prefer answers than questions, because answers provide something to do, whereas questions provide more work. And in watching the select committee this week at the Parliament, they were talking about the Tammy flu and, and how, how come we'd had predicted 750,000 deaths and we only ended up with 150. And most of the policy people said, that doesn't matter. What matters is we executed the plan perfectly. And, and, and that made me think that's what policy is about. And, and it's, I, it just made me think, I'm, I'm on the platform with, in the, in the Times recently, I had a vote for the top 100 scientists in the UK. And it's interesting, there are two people who have voted in the UK Times as one of the top scientists, and, and Ben's down there as the other one, and it's not, I'm applauding you, it's, it's that actually, we've lost the art of communication actually as scientists and researchers. And if we do come out of the future, is, and I think journals have some way lost the art of communication and, and, and criticism, and only recently you had an, an article about why don't we get any more criticism. The newspapers are taking over the agenda, 
you put an article in the newspaper, you write something, you get hundreds of comments from people who want to participate. Some of it rubbish, but some of it actually really influential. And, and, and I think when we get these areas like we don't agree, we don't have a forum great enough actually to communicate we disagree to then change the agenda potentially with policymakers. Okay, thanks. So our final question now, um, and uh, this is one of those ones that I want the panel to just to answer in 30 seconds. Okay. So, Carl, I'm not sure what you'll find more difficult, the question or the fact that it's a 30 second answer. Thanks. What is the one thing that you believe medical publishing can do to transform healthcare? Carl. Okay, clock stick. Okay, I'm going to do something just to keep it simple. One thing I'd like to is to create, instead of when I publish something, I send in a form ticking a box saying yes or no, I don't. I want to create a database for conflicts of interest that are updated every time you publish. In America, ProRepublica did this great job where they got the pharmaceutical industries then to publish how much they were paying and throw that in, and then we'd end up with a common data set where every time you publish something, you just updated it and everybody could see ongoing your transparent conflict of interest. Thank you. Okay. Stop publishing research in journals. Put the research on online databases. Um, make it publicly accessible and um, journals value add through commentary, education, news, investigative journalism and um, the occasional book review. There is an opportunity for better engagement with the public and I think if journals seize that then the result can be beneficial for science, for evidence, for healthcare. So uh, I once heard Muir Gray talk to a bunch of people producing knowledge and he said you've got to work together, it's a big ocean, there's lots of work out there and no one took the blindest bit of difference. I think the answer is we've got to work together a bit more and not necessarily sit in our competitive bunkers. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll agree that we think the debate has started here and I hope you'll carry it on with us downstairs now over our uh, wine and nibbles which have been well deserved from your work today and uh, we'll see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning but it just remains for us to thank our panel speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.